Well, good afternoon and welcome to everyone to uh, today's webinar. This is Right Size Your GIS Footprint with Coordinates. Um, my name is Anne Harper. I'm the Chief of Staff here. And um, yeah, so Coordinates, we are a data management platform and we exist so that people can choose what their favorite desktop software is for the work that they're doing, but still be able to share their data with their teams and their customers. This webinar is called Right Size in Your GIS. And a key thing that that's covering is cost control because building a GIS team is expensive. Um, buying tokens can price people out of their work. And many people in an organization want some slice of GIS functionality or the data, but not needing a whole suite um, to do their work. So using coordinates, you can service a really wide range of people. Coordinates will run alongside your current tools and really extend your reach with your data. We support open formats and we have an architecture that we've built based on Git, um, but we'll dive a little bit into that um, later on in this, in this webinar. So our mission is we really want to help empower you and your organization with the next generation of geospatial data management. So today um, from the team here, we have Jonathan Ball, um, one of our product managers who will be available for questions. So you'll see that there is a question and answer chat available. So if you just pop any um, anything you have in there and Jonathan will um, be around to chat to you. Then um, to lead us through this webinar, we have Eli Chadwick, our sales engineer. Eli's going to give us a brief tour of the platform and then we're going to show you some of the extensions and how we um, connect into some of your other favorite softwares such as QGIS and our desktop app, which um, yeah, helps with a lot of different software. So on that note, I will stop there and hand over to Eli to kick this off. Thank you, Anne. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. As Anne mentioned, I'm going to take you on a tour of the coordinates platform, give you an idea of the features that it has and how it might fit into your organization. So let me just move some things. All right. So just a quick slide to explain, give you some context around coordinates, what it is and how it works. Um, we're in the middle here, coordinates.com. That's our landing page. We are based out of AWS and we run a multi-tenanted architecture insofar as if you sign up for a business plan with us, um, you will have your own area carved out within coordinates.com backend. It becomes your site, you run it, we provide the tooling, you provide the content and the branding. So you can put a custom URL, you can do your own colors, logos, set up your own links and so forth. When people come to that site, they will essentially think it's a site that you own and operate and uh, you'll be able to disseminate all your data to people in whatever fashion that you require. Over on the left, we've got a subset of our customers. Uh, we deal with a bunch of government or federal central agencies, local agencies and commercial entities. Between them, they all have the need to get their data on the internet and shared. Uh, some of them completely open, some of them completely closed, so only to named users. Our licensing model is that you pay for an admin seat. So they, have, they are the users that have the ability to load data onto the platform. Your end users register with your site and we do not charge for end users. So they're free to download, uh, interact with the data in whatever fashion they require. This publish, there's a number of different ways to get your data up onto the coordinates platform. I'll go through those in the demo. There's also at the other end, a number of methods for you to pull data off the platform. We've got well over 200,000 global users that are hitting either coordinates.com or these named sites. And they have a number of different methods of interacting with the data. Some want to pull it down as a service. Some may want to download the data and pull it into their own GIS. And our platform accommodates all of these different requirements. And I'll go through those in the demo as well. Easiest way to get cracking is to open up coordinates.com. So as I mentioned, this is the parent site. Underneath it, we've got a number of publishers. You can access all of the different publishers from here and filter down to their particular, their particular sets that they have uh, published. 
pulls across all of their branding and each of these publishers has their own URL. So you can go directly to their site. They might link from their home site to their GIS um, and distribute their data like that. A couple of things at the top here. We've got a manage button. If you have a paid seat and you're in your own site, you'll be able to hit the manage button. It takes you into the data management area of coordinates. Um, this data browser opens up this data panel and the map I can turn on and off depending on whether you are discovering data or you are interacting with the data. So I can turn that on and off. I can turn the data browser on and off and make it a map centric view. Over here, we do have a region filter. Every layer that gets loaded into your site, we geotag it. It gives you the ability to drill down to a particular area. Quite a common use case is people are doing a project, say, for instance, they're interested in data from New York. I'm looking at some stuff from Suffolk County. So that'll apply a geo filter to the underlying data that's published. And you can now cruise around and look for the data set that you're interested from the area that you're uh, working on at the time. We've also got a data type filter. So just to give you an idea of the different things that we support, vectors, points, lines, and polygons, rasters, aerial imagery, and grids. And that'll just filter down the underlying. So in this case, New York has no grids. Um, we also support tables, sets, and repositories. I'll go into repositories later. They are um, the Git-like thing that we've built and documents. You can also do a search up here. If I just clear that filter out, and we'll go back to vectors because these are mainly vectors in here. Once you've located the data that you're interested in, say for instance, another thing you can do here is you can star data. So if I, I've favorited a few data sets that I wanted to use today, as you log out and log back in again, those favorites will be maintained. You can come back to them at any time. Um, just give that a second to load. Go. So I was interested, as I mentioned, in Suffolk. I can open up one of these, they're called data sheets. One of the founding principles of coordinates is to make data easy to locate, easy to do an appraisal of, um, and then easy to download in the format that you require. And so we provide a bunch of information about every data set. What is, what type is it? How many features are in there? Um, some metrics around its popularity. It's often a good sign that you're looking at the right data set when it's been heavily utilized and then a sample of the data with the attribution that's involved in it. We also give you a heads up about services and APIs. So each of the layers that we publish has different methods of hitting um, the history, how often has it been updated? And then these are the cart repositories. I'll get, as I mentioned, I'll get to those later. So once you have chosen a data set, you can add it to the map. I might be interested in a couple of other layers, like for instance, these flood zones and perhaps the railroads. Once I've loaded all the data into the map viewer, I can close out of the data browser and I'm now in a map viewer centric mode. You can do, we've been developing this concept of GIS Lite. Um, the idea is that a number of our users do not run geospatial software. They don't have any need or ability capability to pull the data down and analyze it. They just need to be able to query data in situ. So to accommodate that, we do things in here like you can do a spatial query. So if I click there, that's going to highlight a bunch of features that it will buffer underneath. Um, in this window, I get to see all the attribution for each of the layers in which I have done my point within Polygon. And I can zoom around the map and look at different features that have been highlighted in there. You can also do things like open up a data table. And from here, you can look at different features that are in the map again. Um, there's not that many, 1800, but it accommodates however many. Um, features you have loaded. You can do things like open up the data card at any given time if you need to revert back and look at the metadata or um, some about information. So again, it's just that whole discovery, 
interact with. Most of our users are going to want to grab a copy of the data and pull it down locally. Another thing you can do with these map viewers is I can rename it. I'll just call this one New York and save it. So this map viewer is now saved against my coordinates user. I could open up additional map viewers. You can have as many as you like. Once you've built up a map viewer, you can do things like hit this link, send that to a colleague and say, I would like you to check out this particular view. It will regenerate the map for that user and they can then click around and do some interrogating. The major maneuver most people will do is they will want to export the data. So what I'll do here is I'm going to grab a copy of this New York Railroads. A um, couple of things to point out. We, by default, crop to the extents that you were viewing, with the assumption being that you are zoomed into the area that you're interested in. You can remove this crop, grab the whole data set, we'll update it, tell you how big the download is about to be. I may decide I don't want these two files, and I'm going to do an export. So in the background there, that's going to tick around, tick away, building a link for me to download. I don't have to hang around here. That um, progress monitor up here will update me as to when it's ready, and then I can just go ahead and download it. So as I, I can jump back in here, I can do more things. Um, I'll just let that tick over. Being a live demo, I had already downloaded it. So I'll show you what that looks like. I've pulled down this um, file. I had specified a geo package. Um, I'll go through how you can do what the format is that you're going to pull down. But here is the railroad data sitting in a geo package on my desktop. And it's now uh, good to go. I can pull that into my GIS and I'm away doing what it is that I required. The other thing I failed to mention, the data gets stored in our backend in the coordinate reference system that the publisher published the data. You can reproject the data into something that makes sense for the uh, task that you have. You can also specify which format you'd like to pull the data down. So another of our sort of founding principles is to be vendor agnostic. Uh, we want to be able to support all the different ecosystems that are out there. So we support Esri shapefiles and file geodatabases. You can pull it down in the map info formats. Uh, to be truly vendor agnostic, you can get it as a CSV, which is going to have a well-known text attribute in it containing the geometry. We like geo packages. It's an open source format, and it is a nice way to transport data around the place that comes in one file and you can have multiple layers embedded in that file. Uh, the other things that you can pull it out as are KML for Google Earth, DWG for a CAD environment or a PDF with your map in there. So that's fundamentally what it looks like from a consumption perspective. There's a whole lot more to it, but we'll keep it simple. What I wanted to go into now is how does one go about loading data onto the platform? To do that, I'll go into this demo site and um, do a quick configuration of a layer just to give you an idea of how you might get your data up there. I mentioned earlier that if you are a publisher, you'll have this manage button. If I go into manage, this is the data management area of uh, coordinates, a bunch of different things you can do. So being a site that you own you can come in and set up the site name the org name you can upload your website icons you can set your colors you have primary there's ability to have a secondary logo um, and then you can build out these navigation so this links you can build out all your custom links to different sites maybe to your parent site add your dividers things like that under users and groups you can come in to here I might create a new group. I'll just call it the GIS group and hit create. That's going to make me a new group. So the next thing you need to do is add users to the group. In order to appear in this drop down, your user needs to have registered with your site. Once they're in there, you can add them to the group. And that's how you go about segmenting your customers up if you were not sharing your data openly across the internet. So you could have 
you know, 100 users in here applied to a group, and then you can add that group access to the layer that you've uploaded. And only those users are able to see that layer. So it's a really, it's a way of sharing data privately with people. And as I mentioned earlier, your end users do not pay a license. They just register and they're away. Under upload, this is how you get data onto the platform. I'll just mention these quickly. Uh, we have a concept of data sources. This is where you essentially build a connection or plumb in a pipe to a container that holds the data that you might want to store it in. Um, we can connect to an Amazon S3 bucket. That is best practice for us, really, if you're pulling across massive point cloud data or rasters. Uh, it doesn't require an HTTPS connection between your machine. Um, so it works nicely like that. It all, we also connect to ArcGIS REST endpoint, so enterprise, server, portal, ArcGIS online. That'll do a scan of the endpoint, find any data sets that are up there, and uh, pull those across. Each layer that you can, can each layer that you configure can be set to auto update, so it'll on a scheduled basis check that endpoint, and if there's new data, it will pull it across. So that's another method for keeping your data up, like, updated in uh, coordinates. This is a data gateway into your organization, Postgres database that's on the internet, or WFS. So the same applies for all of these. They're just in different places. Uh, we are also investigating, looking at connecting to Google Cloud and Azure. Um, so anything that uses S3 compliant buckets, we're looking at adding to the stack. Easiest way to show you how it works is if I go into upload, um, this is the railroad file that I was just looking at. I'm going to upload that. I'll apply it to, in this case, uh, cart, which is a group that I use for this uh, Git-like interaction, and do an upload. So now that data is being copied from my environment up into the coordinates back end. Uh, we do a scan of it, make sure all the geometries are OGC compliant. And once it passes all those tests, it's put into this upload area where it will remain. Um, for a period of time. So you may have loaded up a geo package or file geo database or whatever your strategy was, um, and it might have a ton of layers in it. You can then drill down here. So I look into what we have here. I've got a zip file. I'm going into the zip. I have a geo package. I go into the geo package, and there I have the railroads. I am going to do an import of that. So at the bare minimum, I can do nothing and just scroll down and say, I'm going to do an import. I could go through and configure all of these different things. I can also do that at um, once it's been imported. So what I'll do here is to keep it simple again. Let's just hit import. Now that's going to start chugging away and importing this data set. Once it's imported, all of the different services that we have will be activated off that layer and your users will be able to interact with this uh, railroad file and a number of different methods. What I'll do is jump out of there. Um, you don't have to hang around there. You can go back in, check on its progress. Won't take that long, but we don't have much time. So I will instead go to a copy of it that I'd already imported. So these are the Suffolk County, New York railroads. I can add in any, I can give it any title that I want to. I can give it a description. This will appear in that data sheet. It gives your users an idea of what it is that they're looking at. Any layer that you publish on coordinates, you can have attachments. So we can either upload an attachment or browse to a previously uploaded attachments. This includes things like PDFs, spreadsheets, documents, uh, maybe something like a data dictionary, giving more information about the layer that you have published. And when your users download that layer, they will get the attachment in the zip file as well. Tags just helps with discoverability. The owning group I'd assign to this cart group. Categories, you can build out all your own categories and assign each layer to a category and then the users can filter by category and uh, they might find additional data sets that they weren't aware of. For licensing, we support Creative Commons out of the box. We also have facilities for you to upload, configure your own licenses if that's something that you need to do. If you want to use Creative Commons, just toggle these radio buttons according to your use case. Um, you can attribute a, a primary key to the data set. If you are going to be doing pre frequent updates to this data set, that is a necessity as that's how we will determine whether you are adding, inserting, 
deleting or updating rows. You can have a column that contains the elevations and we'll um, reference that for extrapolation of vertices according to whatever the value is in that attribute column. And then you hit publish. So this is already a published layer. It's denoted as private under the access tab. I can come in here for public access. I've got it set to default to private as it indicates here. I can change this to find only. So you might have a data set that you want to advertise its existence, but not allow people to use. They then request access to the data set. The administrator will get an email. You can approve that. They get added to a group that has access to the layer and they will then be able to um, use it and download it and interact with it. Um, you can also set it to anyone can view registered or download. So any registered users of your site on the internet will be able to download the data. I'll leave this to no access. For well, now, the other thing to point out in here is I was mentioning groups earlier. Say you've built a group and you've put a bunch of users in it and you want them to have access to this layer. In here, you can start adding different groups and you can allow the same privileges can be set here. So the way that's currently set up, only members of this new group can access this data set. Under map services, by default, we apply um, a default cartography to each layer that gets uploaded you might want to do something different if you want to do something different you can come in here say new map style give it a name red say and save it you can then go and edit the style publish it and set it as the default style that will make that layer have whatever cartography you've applied to it so you can do stuff like attribute based coloring um, thematics or chlor choropleth uh, labeling is all managed from within there. That again only determines the way that the data will be viewed in the site. Um, when they download it, they will then have to set their own styles. So that's a uh, quick run through of what publishing looks like. If I go back over here to the manage, I'll see that this guy still is importing. We'll just let that chug away. But essentially, once it's finished, it will look exactly the same as this layer. If I jump back to my slides, cart. I wanted to talk about cart um, briefly. Cart is available now from cartproject.org. It um, adds the capability of distributed version control to the work that you're doing. It's built on top of Git. Uh, if you are familiar with Git, then a lot of this will make sense. If you're not, it really doesn't matter. Um, Cart is available for Windows, Macs, and Linux. It's built, it's essentially an extension of Git. So it's built on Git, works like Git. Like Git, it's a command line interface, and it supports all the current GIS workflows. Some things that it does, it currently works with vector data. We're about to release uh, Cart for Brasta, and we have already released cart for um, LAS or point cloud. You can do all the same things. Sitting on top of Git, it has all the same functionality as Git. So you can create a branch, do your work in a branch, merge that branch back in. You can set up CLI flows. Uh, you can view the full history of a repository. We use Git-like repositories. We obviously call them cart repositories. You can do spatial filtering. So I only want this particular area. That will do a clone of the repository you can make edits to it, push that back up. You don't have to have pulled the whole data set. And it gives you a more atomic method of sharing data, pushing data around, rather than having to upload massive files every time. Like Git, it is a command line interface. Our users are not all going to be command line savvy. So we've built this coordinates desktop app which is a wrapper around cart and it allows you to do all of the data syncing type activities in a GUI, um, which is much simpler if you're not a dev type person. And then to complete the analogy, coordinates backend, we've re-architected so that it supports this cart workflow. So there's a bunch of repositories sitting up in coordinates. When you load, say, your vector layer into coordinates, we mirror it into a cart repository. This allows your end users to do a clone of that layer down to their environment. And it remains connected as opposed to when you export data out, like I did with the uh, railroad data set, 
you've now got a disconnected data set. You've pulled it down. It's a discrete unit of data that is not any longer related to the publisher. So when the publisher makes updates, you won't know about it. When you clone a layer down, it's connected to the remote repository, which contains the data. When the publisher updates their layer in coordinates, you'll get a notification saying this data has been updated and it's simply a one-click update, which I'll be able to show shortly. Just finally on uh, CART, this is how distributed version control works in a coordinates context. We've got top of the tree, coordinates cloud, bunch of CART repositories with data sitting inside of them. A user can clone the repository down to their environment using a number of different methods. They might go cart clone and then hit the URL and that'll pull that down in command line. They might open up the coordinates desktop app, search for the data that they're interested in and then do a clone of it. And then that's going to pull the whole repo down to their environment. And we've also built a plugin for QGIS and we're working on one for Arc Pro so that you can browse the coordinates index from within your GIS without needing to come up to the site, without needing to open any of these apps or use command line. When the data gets delivered, we've chosen GeoPackage as the default uh, working copy. We chose GeoPackage primarily because it's vendor agnostic and you can work on it using anything that can edit a GeoPackage, which is most things. So the use case would essentially go, Arc Pro user clones a repo down, makes the edits on the working copy, and then they commit those edits to the repository and then do a push. That'll send the edits back up to the coordinates cloud where a QGIS user can clone the repo down. They can make their edits on it, push it back up to the cloud. So it negates the need for sending files around by Dropbox, um, having multiple versions, different formats, messiness, being a git -like repository, you can roll back to any point in time. And um, I'll show you how that works using the Coordinates Desktop app. So the Coordinates Desktop app is, so here's that, uh, here's the um, download that I'd set off earlier. I can access that either from within the app or I can go back to the site itself and that'll be sitting up there here. So I can do my download that just pulls down the zip file and the zip file, as I showed earlier, it will just contain that geo package with the data sitting inside of it. I go back to the coordinates desktop app. I can clear that that's been completed. We use the same user interface as we do for the website. Um, users can download this. There's no license associated with it. Um, and they, it just gives your users a different method of interacting with your site. Again, I can do a region filter, all the same things that I was just um, going through up on the website. We can look at point clouds, raster data, whatever we want to do. I can also access my favorites, which are synced up with whatever I was configuring up on the site. If I jump down here, I am going to do a clone of this Suffolk County data set. So again, same data sheet, same information, big difference here. I can also add it to a local map viewer, interact with it on my desktop. What I want to do though is a get. Same story with the spatial filter applied. I can remove that. And I am going to go ahead and say, get me this data. So that's going to pull the data set down. Um, without, again, the big benefit is your users don't actually need to come to your site. They can work entirely locally, pull the data down, but they're still connected to your site. I'll just give that a minute. So that's come down. If I open up the repository, actually, before I do that, let's have a look at the repository. So this is a repo, really, it's a tech speak for folder. In the folder, there's some Git and Cart components. They're storing all the version history in them. The key component here is I have got the data sitting in a geo package. If I jump back into the repo, there's a number of things I can do in here. Here is where I can create new branches, um, work in the branch. That's not a copy of the data. It's a different view of the data and all of your edits will sit within it. And if I open up a QGIS project, 
that is pointed at the railroad data set. Then here we have the data that I had um, pulled down. So this is sitting in that repository. It is still connected to the publisher. If the publisher makes changes, I get a notification within the application and I can apply the edits. What I'm gonna do is a quick piece of editing in here. We're gonna extend this railroad. and do a save. This just gives you all of these things I can do in command line, I can do in um, here, or I can do within QGIS. It really just depends what my um, how I want to work. What CART's done, it's been watching the underlying geo package. It has seen that I've added in a, a new um, section of railroad. I hadn't filled out all of the attributes, but had I, they would be reflected in here. So I can say, I want to add that. I'm going to call it the east line and commit that. So that's going to commit that to my repository. This is all local. Up here, we've got the blue one that's letting me know that I have changes local that are not reflected up on the site. Uh, this is not my data set. I'm a consumer of it, so I don't have the ability to push. I could decide to push it to my own site, um, or if I had edit rights to that uh, bucket that's up on the coordinates platform, I could do a push here. The easiest way to show you how that might work is if I jump into this fictional Auckland airport demo. Um, this is a repository that contains a number of different layers. What we'll do is I'll jump into a Arc Pro session. This is pointed at that same repository that I had previously cloned down. I am going to do an edit on this data set. One of the things to notice here is that you've got a bunch of different layers in here. Um, you can, the, using cart, you can do version control of changes across multiple tables. So what I'll do in here, I'm going to do an edit. I'm going to create a new runway. We're going to pop that over here. Looks like a good spot for it. All right, so I've added a new feature to one of the tables in here. I'm going to save that feature. And then when I navigate back into the desktop app, I can see there's a little pencil here that shows me that there's been some edits done. When I go into the data set, Cart's been watching that uh, Geo package, it's noticed that I've made an edit. And what I want to do is commit that to the history of the repository. So I'm going to call this new runway, hit commit. That adds it to the repository. It's now in the repo, but it's not up on the coordinates cloud. So if I want to share this data, I hit push. It's going to push just, just that edit. That's a big change. Once upon a time, if you wanted to do an edit to a data set, you'd have to upload the entire data set again. We would scan it, find the incrementals, add it to the underlying data. And that obviously can uses a lot more bandwidth. Um, this is simply take one small commit, send it up. It's got this cryptographic hash. Each of the commits have a cryptographic hash. That's a unique identifier for that commit. You can roll the data set back to that point in time. Um, so it gives you the ability to look at the historical edits that have been made to a repository. So now that I have pushed that, I can stop sharing, pass it over to Anne, and she can see whether she can see it at her end. Awesome. Thank you. So you can imagine I am working with Eli and a whole bunch of other people on a project and I'm working here in QGIS on my Mac. As you could see, Eli was working on ArcGIS Pro on a Windows machine. So I've been working away on my airport project with a whole team of say 100 people um, and I would jump into my coordinates app here, open up the airport um, project card and then hit check, which will make a call to the coordinates cloud. And I can immediately see out of 100 people in our team, there's one person who's been working on it today, and that's Eli. 
and he has added a new runway and the attributes look great and I'm happy with this data. So I'm going to hit apply updates, which will bring down just this tiny little change and it's all completed. There we go. Jump back into my QGIS project and then hit refresh. There we go. I've got the runway. So that all looks great. And I want to share back with him a hangar so we can park the planes after they have landed on his runway. So I'll just add that in there. And then save my change in QGIS. Got my app running in the background. So I'll bring that back up. And it has immediately detected that I have made a change. So you can see my new hanger here and my attributes are looking great. So I'm going to hit add and then give it a name. Hanger. And then commit that change, which will then bring it into and store on my local data set. So I've got an extra step here to do some QA and just recheck it and go, yes, I'm happy to share this with the whole team. And at that point, I will hit push. And it's going to push my tiny little change back up into the cloud so Eli and the rest of the team can then um, work from the most current copy. So I'll stop sharing there and hand, hand back to Eli. So just to close the loop on that, I can open up my airport demo. Periodically, it will pulse back up to the remotes. And so if I show you this actually first, this is a building outline set. I've had it cloned down for some time now. Um, a while ago, Land Information New Zealand had published more layers. I find these here. So that's how you'll get updated. You, know, you, you get this notification. You don't have to hit check. And then if you hit apply updates, that's just going to pull those changes down, apply them to my local uh, repo, which has now got quite a lot of history from many, many updates that have been happening to it. I won't do that now because it churns resources. But if I go back into the Auckland Airport demo um, and I do a check, it will find Anne's edits, we hope. Fetch the updates. There they are. Cool. So if I apply those updates, that's just going to pull down from the remote server all Anne's changes that she's made, update my local working copy. That now gets added to the history of the repo. And if I go back into Pro, I find her hangar has arrived. So it's just quite a cool way for users to communicate uh, cross ecosystem. Esri talking to open source. Happy days. So I'll close out of there. Meanwhile, up on the site, if I go into the repositories, this is where that um, Auckland, Airport, Auckland Airport demo is hosted. It's a number of data sets in here. Each of these is able to be used as a data source in the same way that I was going through earlier with the ARC and with the WFS. So if I choose to, I can publish these and then they will do updates. You can have them doing virtual real-time updates of data as it's being edited. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you was, if I open QGIS back up again, and we go to a new project, we've built these uh, plugins that work within coordinates. They have, again, the same UI as the site and the app. I can go into my favorites and go down and find whatever I had favorited earlier, which will be these railroad layers. I can add that to the map. That's going to add it as a service. Or I can say I want to do a get. I want to clone it. I want to clone it into a new folder that I'll call power. I can do a spatial filter using the extents of the map viewer that I'm looking at here. Or I can just go ahead and do a clone. That will do exactly the same thing that the app was just doing. It's cloning this layer down. The idea here is that users can work entirely within QGIS without knowing any of the things that I was just talking about earlier. So now that's brought that down as a repository. If I go back to where I was earlier, I've now got a power repo. And in there, I've got the data that I pulled down. I named this power. I could have maintained the name of the publisher's data set. Once I have it in here, I can simply drag and drop it into the map, add that layer. And 
we have the railroads data. I can remove the service. So this is an XYZ service. Uh, it's basically the same as a WMTS, but the repo gives you the data locally. You can now make all of the changes that you want to make. I can jump in here and I can look at the log and that'll show me the status of all of the changes, the history, everything that I was doing in the app is um, able to be done in here. So you can do your edits, you could control, you can commit the edits and um, it's a, not just essentially another method for users to interact with the data that you have published up onto your site. So that's just about time there. I think I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Did we have any questions that we needed to answer? Yeah, not a lot of questions, but I thought maybe we'd just take a moment and jump back into the services tab, if you could, Eli. But we, we had one question around how um, we can take hosted data and put it into other systems, for example, ArcGIS Online or things like that. So I just wanted to um, show off the, the APIs that uh, come with any hosted data straight out of the box. Um, it varies obviously between uh, raster and vector data, um, but you can see that there's uh, uh, quite a range of options for trying to get data out and into, into your other applications. Anything you'd add to that, Eli? Oh, I just simply that, yeah, so this area here, uh, this is where, say you wanted a raster layer, you wanted to hit it by WMTS, you can hit it um, from here. Say if you had an application and you stored your data up on coordinates, you can, we've got a full suite of spatial queries. So you can do point within polygons, intersects, a bunch of different stuff. It's all documented on our website. Um, when a user registers with your site, they can come in to here and they can manage their API keys. They can create a new API key. They can set the scope of it. Um, and that allows them to then plug that into, uh, say, if you were hitting it programmatically through a web app or something like that. And then we give you the URL that you were needing for that. Um, so, yeah, that's really all I'd add to that, I think. Cool. We just had another really good question, Eli, um, which I'll, I'll read out. Uh, I saw S3 was supported. Do you support programmatic loads from an AWS workflow? Uh, what, when you say programmatic loads, are you uh, I'm assuming what you mean is when um, an AWS workflow, to answer your question, there's a, on each layer that gets published, there's an attribute called auto update. And you set the auto update using a cron expression. So you might say, for instance, every Wednesday at midnight, I want you to rescan the underlying data source. Um, you can have that be as granular as you like. And um, so you can't webhook into it per se, but you can set the layer up to check the underlying data source and repopulate itself with whatever it has found in there, which is quite a common workflow for people to um, keep a data automatically updating itself, data set. Hey, well, thanks, guys. Um, so, yeah, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Um, we gave you a brief tour of the platform. We showed you cart and version control in the app, how to share with other people with um, th through using the app, and the QGIS plugin. So the key thing we want to really get through is that coordinates is about a data-first approach. It works really well alongside your data creation tools and gets you to reach your users with the formats that they need for their tools. Um, and can really extend your reach and right size your GIS to service your customers. Um, please give our app and our plugin a go. They are free for users. Um, we've got some developments coming out for them soon. There'll be some upgrades and we'll do some more webinars to help support and train people on those too to make it a bit easier. Um, and also please do get in touch if you're interested in using coordinates for your own data sets um, to share with your customers. So yeah, have a great day and um, we hope to see you guys on future webinars. See ya. Bye, thank you.